All right, we're back with some casual conversation about uh, vertical stuff. So this is part of a series of tutorials uh, intro introdu introducing aspects of our vertical workflow. And we're about to talk about creating content with our markdown. So in a vertical project, we can uh, use our markdown to create all sorts of different kinds of content in terms of research assets, posters, experiments, papers, slide decks, and so on. I'm going to do probably two videos on R Markdown. Uh, the first video is going to go through some slides I prepared a while ago. Um, see how that goes. And then in the next video, I'll just fool around with some R Markdown documents. Um, and talk about them as I do that. Sometimes it's useful just to see uh, examples of, of this stuff happening in real time. And actually, before I move on, I'll, I, I will show just a quick example because so we all know kind of what we're talking about. If you were to open up our studio, let's make a new session and let's just really quickly get ourselves into a new project. We're going to start out making some stuff. Let's call this. Um, test our markdown and I'm going to put this on the desktop and I will press go if you wanted to try out an R markdown document right now you could just do something like this go over to the plus sign click on R markdown give yourself a title press OK and here you have it you've got a template R markdown document we'll talk about all of this later but the neat thing you can do right now is you can knit this document by pressing this button it's going to ask you to to save the output somewhere and actually actually at this point the file untitled one hasn't been saved anywhere so we're going to give it a name um, test this will save the file as a dot rmd file for our markdown so here it is and notice something appeared in the viewer. This is a, an HTML version of this document. So it prints out a bunch of things for us, including text and R code and R code output and figures and all sorts of things. This is just the beginning of what you can accomplish with R Markdown. And notice now we have um, an HTML file here too that we could, for example, we could view this in our web browser. So that's a really fast intro to R Markdown. Um, let's talk about these slides and see how that goes. I recommend going over to our studio and let's do that. Let's for fun, watch the R studio video about our markdown. Uh, I'll press play. I don't think there's any audio. Can I fast forward this? Yay. Our markdown. It does some stuff. It connects these things, which is so many things. <laughs> But the main thing is you can output your R Markdown document to a bunch of different file types. Uh, in my slides, I'm going to go over these basic parts of an R Markdown document. Um, is this thing on fast forward? No, it's just going. All right. We kind of just looked at this, um, how we're going to be working with an R Markdown document in R Studio, And... Uh, the, the best part about this video is coming up just in a moment, in my opinion. So hang tight. Uh, right. So here we see an example of knitting this one document to a website, which we did. But oh, look at that. A PDF, a Word document. Oh, my God. A handout <laughs> and uh, an HTML notebook and slide decks different kind of slide decks, more slide decks. Uh, oh, so many different kinds of slides you could do if you wanted a dashboard. That's cool. A website. Oh, wow. And a, a whole book even. <laughs> and um, so this is what's really cool about our markdown. You've got this one document. It's a text file. You can kind of mix and match regular words with code and this from this one file we can generate so many different kinds of outputs which is really cool 
another way to think about this in terms of vertical is we're learning a skill and that skill is using our markdown. And if we learn that one skill, we can, we can apply that skill to generating so many different kinds of content. So that's why our markdown is, is pretty nifty. The more I learn about it, the more I'm like, it's really great. There's some details. Uh, let's see if I can briefly talk about this. Basically, an R Markdown document is a text file, and it has a few, it can contain different kinds of text. We'll see it can contain regular text, and it can contain code chunks, usually uh, R code, but it can have other kinds of code too, Python, JavaScript, so on. Uh, there's a, a function or a package called Knitter, and this package translates an R Markdown document into a, into a Markdown document, which is also plain text. And then we use uh, Pandoc, which is a general document conversion library to convert a Markdown document to a number of different kinds of formats. Uh, this is, yeah, so a lot of this stuff is going on behind the scenes for if you're new to this, you don't really need to know too much about this workflow. You basically are just working over here on your R Markdown document and you'll press the knit button to make it into the thing you want it to be. Uh, it, but it's worth recognizing that there's this background process and there's a lot of transformation of this document into other document types. And the more you dig into the code, uh, you can gain a lot of control over the different kinds of transformations you might want to have. If you have RStudio and you don't have R Markdown installed, you should install it like this. If you try to knit something, it'll, it won't, won't work unless you have this installed. Here's some really, uh, here, here's a nice example where you could see some of the uh, aspects of Markdown in here. Uh, so this is, this side, we're looking at the text file, which is an example RMD. And when we knit this one, it creates an HTML file that looks like this over here. And you can see how some of the styling of the HTML is controlled on the left side by the markdown process. For example, one hashtag makes a level one header. If you don't do anything, you just make plain text. If you surround words with one star, you get italics, two stars, you get bold. Uh, if you put dashes in front of things, you get a bulleted list. If you surround words with three back ticks, you get a code block. You can write, uh, whoops, you can write things in between dollar signs. And in there, you can put latex style math equations, and then they'll print out as math equations. Uh, there's, so this is just a brief example here of the markdown syntax that you would be using. And um, so part of learning to write in R Markdown is learning the basic Markdown syntax. There's lots of great, uh, th that syntax isn't terribly complicated. And uh, if you're familiar with LaTeX, it's, it's basically like very simple LaTeX. If you're not familiar with it, I, I'll make sure to point you in some, towards some links uh, so that you could see all the other things that you can do with Markdown. The cool thing about R Markdown is that not only can you render Markdown, but you can also add in R code chunks. So in this example, the top part is some Markdown. So this is gonna make a header, this is gonna make some text, and the grayed out part is R code. And when we knit this document, we embed the code along with its output. So this is uh, pretty cool, uh, especially if you want to make documents that have uh, kind of like a lab journal or data analysis or something like that. You could have your 
R code that does your analysis and have it print out uh, the, the results. It's also possible to do what's called inline R code. So if you're writing a sentence, you could embed in that sentence a little call to R. So in this one, we're going to add up these numbers. And uh, when you render your document, you'll get the, so, so here you'll get the number six printed in there. And this style of doing things is super useful when we eventually get into writing APA papers with Papaja. It's, it's possible to write your results sections this way so that you never have to type your uh, numbers from your t-test or whatever uh, directly into the manuscript. You have R do that for you. Um, Okay, I think that's all I wanted to say about this quick tour. Let's go back to the slide deck and keep going. So the take home message was that our markdown combines plain text with code and, and you can output this one document to lots of different document types. And in vertical, we'll be using this one kind of uh, document, the R Markdown document, to create APA papers, slides, and posters, and so on. So for example, this, this slide deck we're looking at right here, this was written in R Markdown. If you want to go right into everything R Markdown, then you could go and check out the definitive R Markdown guide. This is everything you need to know. And uh, I'm just pointing out, I, I look at this all the time, um, but I'm not going to go over it because it's a huge definitive guide to our markdown. Worth knowing about as a resource. Here's a link to some basic markdown syntax. Uh, and there's, if you check, I, I like this website, Pimp My RMD. Uh, you'll find that there's all sorts of bells and whistles you can add on to your R Markdown documents to accomplish all sorts of things. And this is a nice website showing some of those bells and whistles. So we think that R Markdown is a pretty good option for uh, reproducible science. If you write your paper in R Markdown, that uh, document uh, can contain all the code and the data that you use uh, to run analyses and report results. And it can contain all that stuff in one place. So ostensibly, if, if, if everything works properly and all, uh, someone should be able to obtain your R Markdown document and knit it on their own computer and reproduce everything that you did in the paper. Okay, we, at the very beginning of this, there's a movie here about creating a new R Markdown document from our studio, but we already looked at that. So the remainder of this little slideshow is looking at uh, a few pieces of our Markdown documents just to get us thinking about these pieces. So here's an example. Uh, document that I have here. I guess I have some goals for this slide. What are they? So imagine the goal was to create a new R Markdown document, to load some data, and to generate a figure and report some descriptive statistics. This is a minimal example of a pipeline you might want to set up to start learning about R Markdown. So this picture here shows everything you might need to do that. Uh, we have the beginning part of an R Markdown file, which is called the YAML. We can get, give a title, some other aspects of the document, such as your name and date. We'll, we'll learn that the parameters here can uh, vary depending on the template that you're using. Another thing that's very common is this setup chunk. You'll see this at the beginning very 
often. We'll talk about what this means later, but it basically allows you to set options that control how your document is compiled. So the top part is just set up, and then the bottom part is going to accomplish these goals. Um, we talked about hashtags before, so we've got two here, so that's gonna make this a level two header, and it's gonna print speed histogram. We've got a little R code chunk, and inside the R code chunk, we have uh, a line that says cars dollar sign speed. Cars is a data frame that comes packaged with R. So if you were to, let's see, just type in cars, you'd see some numbers pop up because this is lives in R. And if you just said cars dollar sign speed, you'd see the numbers in the speed column. And if you did cars dollar sign speed inside the hist function, you'd generate a histogram. So that line of code is written in the R code chunk. So the expectation is when we run this, we'll generate a histogram in our HTML output. Another thing we do here is calculate the mean of that column. And then in the bottom, uh, we do some inline stuff to report those values. Uh, I guess, take my word for it, if, if you put these things into our studio, it would all work. Maybe I can do that just real quick, just to show. So I've got to write it all down. Um, Let's see if I can do that super fast. Sorry, I forgot about setting this up in advance. So speed, histogram. If you do option command I on a Mac, you'll generate this whole code chunk right away, which is pretty cool. And all right. So finally, the mean speed was, there it is. And I'll just, uh, so the cars data frame has two columns, um, speed and distance. And up here, we calculated the mean of the speed column, put it in a variable. So down here, we're going to print that out but it, we could print the mean of the distance column too. We didn't calculate that up here, but we can calculate that in an in a inline code chunk if we wanted to. I think we've got it working. So if I press knit, then we will see uh, everything we looked for. We've got the header printing out, we've, we've got uh, the code chunk printing out. We've got the histogram and we have printed out these lines with the numbers in there as well. So that's a quick example. Let's talk about some of the structural details of our markdown documents. We're going to talk about the YAML front matter, the setup chunk, the code snippets, uh, some of the knitter options for these snippets and some general tips and tricks. So at the front of the top part of our markdown documents, you'll see stuff in between three dashes. And this stuff is YAML front matter. I think that stands for YAML ain't markup language. So it's a uh, self-referential acronym. This kind of markup language, really, it's just a way to declare uh, parameters for your document. That's what I'll say for now about that. Most R Markdown documents uh, are connected to rendering templates, and those templates specify the parameters that need to, need to be written about in the 
the YAML front matter. So depending on what uh, template you're using, you might be asked to put more stuff there. And as you learn more about controlling your R Markdown documents, you'll, you'll realize that you can sort of add things and take some control uh, over, over these parameters to increase the flexibility with which you can generate documents. Um, in, this, in this simple example, it's kind of straightforward what you need to put in here, a title, your name, the date, and it's gonna render an HTML document. All right, this is a little picture of the front matter for this slideshow that I'm presenting right now. And as you can see, the, the YAML is a little bit expanded. We've got a different kind of output here. It's a slidey presentation and we've got some options. Um, just as an example, self-contained refers to whether the HTML will will be one big HTML file with all of the stuff embedded for for displaying the HTML or whether it's going to be a um, an HTML file with a bunch of folders containing the libraries that need to be run. This sets the CSS theme for the slideshow and incremental true sets whether or not when I press forward the next things display uh, incrementally. But the point of this slide is the setup chunk. Uh, you'll often see a knitter options setup chunk right after the YAML front matter. So here's an example of that. If we went back to our test example, we see a setup chunk right here too. Now this uh, setup chunk, it's not particularly special. You, you could delete it, it doesn't need to be there. So if we, we could run it without it, that's fine. And, uh, but what it is, let's talk about what it's doing. And yeah, I don't know if this is, this might, it took me a while to actually realize what was going on with this setup chunk. Uh, for now, I'll say inside the setup chunk, we can list by comma separated values, different knitter uh, options. And these options will apply to the entire document. So for example, echo equals false, uh, that or true, you, that controls whether or not the code chunks get displayed in the output. For example, In this output, this code chunk is being displayed in the output. This uh, gray bar here is the code chunk. If we were to say echo equals false and redo this, we're gonna make that code chunk disappear. If we make it say echo equals true, it'll come back. So echo is a parameter controlling whether this thing gets printed. So we haven't specified anything here. The default is that echo equals true. I deleted the setup chunk, so let's make another one. And really all I'm doing here, when you put an R, in that position, you're declaring that this code chunk will be an R code chunk and not a different code chunk. For example, if you put JS, it would become a JavaScript code chunk. So we'll just keep it as R. This, this one is the variable name we're giving this code chunk. Usually that's used to refer to a code chunk later, potentially for a figure or something like that. Setup's a good word for our setting up our document you could doesn't need to be named setup but it's it's come it's that's the name that everyone uses here our setup and include equals false so this is actually a knitter option um, but let's add that include equals false 
And then, I can't remember how to write these things, knitter, two colons. And if you don't know what's going on here, we're, we're just writing the name of the package and two colons allows us to go in there and then declare the name of a function. Um, so there's a ops underscore chunk. Actually, this is sort of like a object thing inside here. Dollar sign sets. Okay. Now, whatever we write in here in terms of knitter uh, options, they'll be applied to all of the other code chunks in the document. So if I say echo equals false, what should happen here? Well, um, we're basically saying make echo equals false for any code chunk that appears in the remainder of the document. This one, remember, it, it hasn't been, the default was true, but now that we set the default for the document as false, when we knit this, we'll see the code chunk disappear. I'm just gonna copy this again. And uh, let's just make a, a simple code chunk that does one plus one, knit it again, and we'll go to the bottom and we'll see the output is being shown, that's a two, but we've hidden the code chunk because we've set it to false as a global parameter. You can go into individual code chunks and define or declare your knitter parameters on a chunk by chunk basis. So we did that. We don't see the, the code chunk up here, but we do down here because we told this one to echo equals true. All right, moving on. Warning. This is another one that usually happens when you load a package. When you load packages, you can get warnings and messages or, or any time that you do something, run a function that causes a warning to occur. Uh, you can choose to have these warnings get printed or not. So I usually say warning equals false. Let me see. And actually, to be honest, I always forget the differences between warnings and messages. They're kind of similar, and I never know. Usually I want to suppress them both. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. So in this code chunk, I'm going to load the dplyr library and see what happens. So when we do that in our document, we're getting warnings printed. And what if you don't want to see those? Well, you could say warning equals false. Knit that. And the warning one way, but these other things are still appearing. That's because those are messages. Message equals false. I don't want to see those either. Okay, that's a way to not display the warnings and the messages in your R Markdown document. Uh, fig.align. This one controls figure alignment. I put that here as a, an example to go over. Uh, I often use knitter chunks to control figure, the details of figures. If you go into a code chunk and start typing FIG, you'll see there's all sorts of different controls over figures. Let's see if we can kind of just give an example here. So center, probably this is already centered. Let's see if we can make it smaller. So fig dot width. Uh, talking about, I should probably do a video really actually about figures and knitter because it can get a little confusing. There's a, yeah, so that didn't work. 50% didn't work. Uh, why not? 0.5. No. Um, mm, 
not working either. <laughs> okay, so there's an example. I was, I, some of the things I tried work in different situations. Here, what's going on, I think, is we're specifying the, it, the width in inches, and this is somehow getting translated uh, over here. So if we went to 2.5, we should get a wider figure. There, are there, okay, so that's a wider figure, great. I just wanted to show that if we do things like fig align, if we do left, we should be able to control that this is going to be on the left and stuff like that. Just a brief example of how you're going to be using knitter options for figures uh, to control how they get displayed. Cache, this is a useful one to know about. Okay, and how should I talk about that one? Let's say, oops. All right. Um, yeah, if you set cache equals true, this can be useful. Uh, trying to think about, okay, I'm not gonna do a figure here, but let's do this. Let's take the mean, well, let's, um, let's generate a thousand random numbers fr from a normal distribution um, centered on zero with a standard deviation of one and then get the mean of that. If, if we press play here, this would do that stuff for us. So we generated a, a thousand numbers and we got the mean it's right there. Every time we do this, we should generate a new set of 1000 numbers and, the, and a, new need, a new mean. All right, let's knit. Okay. Oh, we've got an error. Oh, that's okay. So that's because I deleted some stuff in here. Like I deleted the mean speed variable. So I have to delete a few more things. So I was trying to print the mean speed variable, but it wasn't there. Okay, great. So we knitted this. Now we're seeing the calculation of a mean. Notice that this number is different from that one. So it um, definitely sampled some new numbers and found the mean. Now it actually did this in a background process. And because I have cache saved or set to true, it saved uh, this information in a variable. And when I re-knit, it will just, rather than recomputing this code, it's just going to grab the saved stuff from before. So if I knit this again, we'll see that this number doesn't change, right? Uh, so when you have cache set to true, any uh, variables that you create through the process of knitting your code chunks, they get saved to a cache. And when you re-knit, the va values from those from the saved state just get applied to creating the document. And this can be useful if you're running code chunks that take a long time to compile, like, like a simulation or something like that. Um, so you could maybe run the simulation one time, have cache set to true, and then the next time you knit the document, it won't take very long because you won't actually have to rerun the simulation. It'll just be loading up the saved values. But the cache can also be problematic if you want to be re redoing everything. So it's an option and you can use it depending on what you want to do. Okay, uh, out dot width. Uh, this is again related to figures. I, I think I will, should I say something about this now? Um, I don't know, this is mildly complicated. 
I think. I'll try to say something about out.width. Um, we'll learn later that you can compile your R Markdown document to different kinds of things, like an HTML file, a LaTeX file, a uh, Word document, and so on. Depending on the final output format, uh, some of the knitter parameters, um, let, me, let me back up and say, some of the knitter parameters depend on these final output formats. So fig.width can, the values that you put in there uh, depend on whether you're producing an HTML file or say a LaTeX file. And whew, obviously I haven't thought about this well enough to be able to talk about it out loud. Um, generally the fig dot parameters are set up in, in, uh, connected ways. So they're tailored for their particular output format without dot width, you can sometimes get around these connections, um, to basically send out parameter values from your R Markdown document that can be picked up later by a, a different, or by, by Knitter or by Pandoc um, to, to control some parameter you need controlled down the line in terms of this conversion process. Oh God, this is the th kind of thing I was trying to avoid. Maybe, maybe the point is that um, at the beginning, simple stuff is pretty easy. And uh, when you start looking at how knitters set up, lots of complicated things are possible. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about code snippets. Code snippets are simply these grayed out things. And I mentioned before that if you press Option Command I, you can just make one happen really fast. I'll just show that again. So let's say I'm down here, do option command I, and I just made a code chunk without having to type it out. If you type it out, three back ticks, curly brace R space, three back ticks. You'll know it's working when it's um, grade just like that. Okay. And when you have a code chunk, you can press this play button. And what it's going to do is basically run the code chunk. It's equivalent to playing or so let's say we did one plus one here. So that's some R code. I could press play and this runs that. And in, in my case, it's actually going to be printing out underneath the code chunk. But uh, it's also printing out in the console. So effectively pressing play is the same as copying your code into the console and pressing enter. So you could test out your code that way, convenient. Let's dive into the anatomy of this code chunk. There's some syntax to it. First of all, this first uh, we have an R here. This defines the language you're going to use. Generally, it'll be R. Whatever word you put here before the comma is going to be the name of your code chunk. And a lot of times I just don't put anything here. You don't need to. But if you do put something here, you can refer to it later. Uh, this is convenient for referring to figures. After the comma, what we're going to put is just an endless list of knitter options. So here we have two, if we want them. Ev oh, eval, yeah, I didn't talk about that one. That's a useful one to talk about. And echo, we talked about echo. That one determines whether the code chunk gets printed or not. Eval de determines whether the code chunk gets run or not. So we could look at that up here. I'm going to set cache to, I'm just going to 
set that to false. And here I'm going to comma say eval equals false. And I'm going to say echo equals true. By declaring this, I'm I'm causing the code here to be printed. So we're gonna we should see a gray box with this code in it because echo is true. But it won't get evaluated, so we won't see an output. And there we have it. We have the code chunk, but notice there's no uh, white box underneath showing the mean. That's because this code chunk was never computed. It's useful to know about eval equals false, um, especially if you have something that's going to make an error. Like if, if we do this, uh, we should get an error. Oops. Norm normally we would get an error if the eval was set to true because we are trying to find the mean of a variable a, b, but that has not been defined, so it throws an error. And one thing you'll find out when you're using our markdown is that if your code contains an error, you won't be able to knit the whole thing. It will stop. And sometimes you might want to knit your document even if it has errors. Um, so one way to do that is to set eval equals false. And this way, it won't attempt to run the code, so the error will never be produced. There's actually another one. Uh, let's say error equals false. I think it's false. Let's find out. Nope, not false. Okay, so if you set error equals to true, you, you can kind of get past the error and you'll compile your document. And instead of um, stopping the compilation process, the error will be printed. Um, so that's useful to know also. Okay, what else do we have to talk about? We went through all of these things. Um, oh, yeah, there's some useful figure options. I Like I said, I, I might just talk more about that one day. This is a really useful option. The dev option can control um, the output of the figure as a PDF or PNG. Well, actually, let, let, let's just talk about these two things right now. It's super useful. Uh, I'm going to make a figure when we do this. I'm just going to delete all these things. Great, so this uh, document produces a figure. And actually, it's being generated over there. So I could go get that figure if I wanted. I'm just going to clean up all this stuff. So right now we have a really simple R Markdown document that just prints a figure. If you wanted to, to get this thing, this figure, and save it in a particular location, you could do fig.path, and I'm just gonna I'm just gonna call it figs. So let's knit that and let's go look for the path figs. Did it get created? I don't see it anywhere. No. What happened? I don't know. Do I have to go like this? No. Or do I need to make the folder first? Let's try that. No, that didn't work either. <laughs> um, oh, we need the we need that backslash like this okay so now our figure has been saved 
in that folder. That's nice. And there is a dev option. I think it would work like that. So here we're saying, yeah, let's export that as a PDF. Um, in this case, we're not going to be able to see the PDF in this web browser, but if we went to the folder, we would have a PDF version of it. So that's useful to know. I mentioned this uh, earlier. It's important to recognize that when you knit your document, it's going to spin up a new R session behind the scenes. And when you're new to this, if you don't recognize that's happening, it can lead to some funny behavior sometimes. Uh, when you press knit, the code chunks get rendered in order from top to bottom. And that can matter if you, for example, Let's do some examples here. So what I'm doing is I just put a one into the variable A. I make another code chunk and I'm going to say, let's print that variable. And it works because first I put the one into an A and then I can print it. But what if I try to do this? If I try to print it before I put something, before I make it. So here we're gonna to try to print an A, but it, at this point it doesn't exist. We get an error because the order matters. Now there's something, uh, uh, interesting here. Let me run this. So I, I put the a, a one into an A and we can see in our environment that the, the A variable has a one in it. Great. And that means I can actually run this code chunk here. I can press play and it will print the one. So you might think, well, I can press play on this chunk and it works and I can press play on this chunk and it works. So both of my chunks work. I should be able to knit the document, but I get an error. Why do I get an error when they both work? Um, here's what's going on. When I press this button, what I actually did was ran this line of code in the console for the current R session. That caused my environment to contain this variable with a one in it. However, when you press knit, what's actually happening behind the scenes is you're loading up a brand new R session that you don't get to see. That brand new R session has an empty environment. It does not have an A with a one in it. Uh, the contents of that behind the scenes session uh, that, that of that environment gets populated uh, with whatever happens in your R markdown file from top to bottom. So when we press knit, the reason we get an error is because we try to print a variable that doesn't exist yet in that other behind the scenes R session. Um, so I just have this very same example here and let's try that actually. This, this is just another way this can happen. Let's say we want to make a ggplot. Talk about plotting some other day. But uh, you might say, yeah, I, I'm going to make ggplots and I'm going to load the library ggplot2. So we've loaded the library. We're ready to go. I can get in here, write a quick 
piece of code to grab the car's data. And then I'm going to set up a graph where the x-axis is going to be speed and the y-axis is going to be dist. And I'm going to say, let's look at some points there. And seeing as ggplot is loaded, you can double check that with the, with the check mark. We should be able to press play and make that plot. There it is. And that's great. You'll, you'll probably often find yourself in this kind of situation um, where you've loaded up a package and you're using it over here. But let's knit the document now. It won't work. Why are we getting an error? Well, uh, remember, when we press knit, it opens up a new R session that's clean. It has nothing going on. Uh, in that new R session, the ggplot2 package has not yet been loaded. And so when we try to run a ggplot function, it won't work because the library hasn't been loaded. That library has been loaded in my current R session because I did that right here. What we need to do is take this line of code, pop it in our knitter document so that when we knit the document, it loads ggplot2 in the behind the scenes version of R. And now the, now the plot works. Uh, here's some random tips for using RStudio. If you're in a code chunk, you can press tab inside of these two quotation marks and that will help you find files. So let's say you're looking for a file at some point inside, I don't know, maybe, maybe you want, to, and I'll show this some other time, you want to use the include graphics function to go and take a figure that you have somewhere, for example, in your figs folder, and you want to bring it into a document and display it. If you type the quotations, you can press tab, and it will give you some stuff that you can choose from right away in your file path or your folder. And that's pretty, pretty quick, and it's better than typing out that stuff. So if you're like, well, where is that thing in, oh, it's in the figs folder, and where, oh, I want this one, right? So we could do this, and what's going to happen here is it's going to print out that histogram for us. Oh, I just did the external graphics example. Great. If you know how to use LaTeX style math equations, you surround things with dollar signs and they'll get printed out as math. Uh, you can directly write HTML and LaTeX into your R Markdown document. Uh, so you could write something like this and let's do that. This, this creates a paragraph element. So this, this basically is the same as writing this. In this case, we will see two paragraph elements. They'll both say paragraph element. Um, when we hit knit, remember what's going on is we're creating an HTML document. So if we were to look at it, this one here, Let's open that in the editor and go down and see what actually has been made. Oh, all sorts of stuff is getting loaded. Looks complicated. But where's the body? Here it is. So we included this right here, right? So that just got printed directly. But when we did this, the, the process of compiling to Markdown and through Pandoc adds the P's for us. So it turns that line into a paragraph element. Anything else here? All right. Um, so far, we've only looked at pressing knit to generate HTML, and that creates these web page documents. I mentioned at the very beginning that we can knit to all sorts of other things like PDF. 
slide decks and Microsoft Word and so on. One minor compu complication with our markdown and rendering to PDF involves LaTeX. So the process takes our markdown and generates a tech file and then uh, the tech files are turned into a PDF file. So if you want to be able to create PDFs, for example, uh, PDFs for an APA paper or something like that, then I recommend following the instructions here through the PapaDrop package for installing a tech distribution. There's a few ways to do it. Um, and check these instructions out. There's a tiny tech package that's pretty helpful, uh, but you can also install the, the large distribution and that's what I did and it seems to work pretty well. Wow, this is way longer than I wanted to do, but whatever. Okay, easy answer is do tiny tech. The long answer is do a full LaTeX distribution. And that is it. So, oh man, I started slowing down. So apologies for, I, you know, this is a video you should watch on fast forward. And I, I'm about done for today, I think. Until next time.